Hello, everyone. I'm Heather Cardine, OAGC President. Welcome to Family and Community Day. We are very excited about the lineup for today from our guest speakers to our Family and Community Day uh, panel. I'm sure you will find today not only interesting, but informative as well. And now I'd like to introduce our Family and Community Day, Community Day Chair, Sarah Watson. Thank you so much, Heather. Um, so as Heather said, uh, my name is Sarah Watson, and I am the Family and Community Division Chair for the Ohio Association for Gifted Children. And our um, division exists to um, provide support to caregivers of gifted children um, kind of throughout their children's educational journey from K through 12. And we offer kind of two types of support. So one is uh, sort of support for individual um, families and caregivers. We, we're here to answer questions about gifted identification and service. Um, things like early kindergarten entrance. Just if you have any questions, we encourage you um, to reach out. And if I don't know the answer, I can find somebody who can help you. Um, and then we also provide support for our local gifted organizations. And we're really excited to have two of them here um, today to talk about parent advocacy. Um, so Family and Community Day is one of our big annual events. And um, we just wanna thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedule to join us today. So without further ado, I'm gonna introduce our first keynote speaker, Dr. Jonathan Plucker. So Dr. Plucker is the Julian C. Stanley Endowed Professor of Talent Development at Johns Hopkins University, where he works at the Center for Talented Youth, also known as CTY, um, and at Hopkins School of Education. He graduated with a BS in chemistry, in chemistry education, and an MA in educational psychology from UConn and also has a PhD in educational psychology from the University of Virginia. His research examines education policy, creativity, talent development, um, and he has over 300 publications um, to his credit. His recent books include Excellence Gaps in Education and with, with Scott Peters, who some of you may know, and Creativity and Innovation. Um, Dr. Plucker is the recipient of multiple awards and is a past president of the Society for the Psychology of Aesthetics, Creativity, and the Arts, and is the immediate past president of the National Association for Gifted Children. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Flutter. Thank you, Sarah. Um, okay, um, it's great to be here with you today. Thank you for taking the time um, on a uh, beautiful fall Sunday afternoon. I was out running earlier. It's just a beautiful day here in central Ohio. Um, I'm going to be talking about um, how to encourage creativity in our children. Um, I've got about uh, 40 minutes, 30, 40 minutes here. So I'm going to go fairly, fairly quickly. Um, I'll make sure that you have access to these slides afterwards. So you don't, you don't have to take pictures of the slides or take notes. Um, I'll make sure you get a copy of this. So without further ado, I do want to thank my colleagues at Johns Hopkins, especially my bosses um, who give me time to do things like this. Um, it's one of uh, the favorite things that, that I do. If you don't know about the uh, CTY podcast, I want to call it to your attention. If you just search for Bright Now, wherever you get your podcasts, uh, I think in the end we did 20, 25 episodes um, focusing on all sorts of issues that um, primarily parents brought to us that they wanted to learn more, more about. Um, uh, we're very, very happy with how, with, with how it came out. Um, uh, the host got a lot better in seasons two and three. He wasn't very good in season one. <clears throat> Um, and uh, we're not making any more episodes. I think there's a chance we may resurrect it soon, but definitely check that out. It's all free, et cetera. Um, I've already said that. Okay, quick quiz. How many people worked as smartphone designers in 2007? This is an old joke, so I will jump to the punchline since I can't see you. Uh, practically none, they were all locked in Steve Jobs' basement. Um, which is only a small joke. Uh, and I, uh, the, um, the point here is that uh, the world economy culture is all changing so incredibly quickly. Um, we really don't know what the jobs of tomorrow are going to be. I was once talking to a governor in a nearby state 
And he was talking about, you know, we need to get these kindergarten students started on a journey to the jobs of the future. And it was a great political talking point, but I had to bite, bite my tongue because I was thinking, we don't know what the jobs of the future are, are going to be by the time they get to middle school, let alone when they graduate high school, graduate college, graduate graduate school. Like we don't know what those jobs are going to be. Think about how many sort of advanced jobs now, some of which require college degrees, some of which don't, um, are just involved with technology and big data and coding and machine learning. Uh, millions of jobs around uh, the country and around the entire globe, right? Um, very few of those jobs could have even been predicted in 2007. And um, for many of us, 2007 doesn't sound that long ago. It was a decade and a half ago, right? Um, yeah, that's a long, long time ago. So we have these devices, right? Uh, the, last, the last estimate I saw was that you can access 96 to 98% of all the information humans have ever created using your phone now, right? Um, that means that our use of libraries is different. It means that there's so much data floating around that accessing data is a less important skill than evaluating data, using data, right? So things change rapidly. As they change, what's the one commonality? What's the one commonality that I see in, say, all the students I've had over the years? Um, uh, I've taught elementary school, high school, undergraduate um, graduate students over the past 30 odd years. Um, uh, the ones who seem to be the most successful are the ones who are creative. They see every challenge as something to be solved. Um, they have very good content knowledge, especially once they sort of picked an area. Um, but many of them have jobs now that we could have not predicted when they were my student because the jobs didn't exist. Um, in some cases, they've created new jobs that, that no one had thought of before. Um, and so uh, it's about creativity. How do we use information to create new information? Um, and that's what I'm really going to be talking about here for the next 25 minutes or so. Uh, and I, this is just um, from a bunch of... Um, economists uh, talking about the types of skills that are needed in um, jobs as we move forward. So based on the year that you were born, um, uh, these trends are, are, uh, are, are only, only continuing. Um, complex communications and expert thinking, um, what we consider non-routine cognitive jobs in economist talk, um, where you're solving problems that are potentially different every single day. Um, those are the types of jobs that our children are going, are going to be um, uh, preparing for. Um, and I say this is very, very personal for me. I have a um, college senior and a high school junior, and we talk all the time, and uh, it's all about what are you going to do next? What's the best job? What are we thinking? Where are various industries heading? Um, how can you make a living at something? Um, of course, my primary concern is that I want them to be happy. Uh, and we know that exercising your creativity certainly helps with quality of life. Um, uh, you know, but I also want them to be able to support themselves now that they're on the edge of adulthood. One just turned 21 and one just turned 17 last weekend. So um, uh, these, these issues are top of mind for my family. So let's talk a little bit about what creativity is. Um, people who study creativity talk about um, primarily three different types. They actually talk about a few more. We're not going to get into those weeds. There, there are just three that I think most parents should be keeping in mind. The first is big C, capital C, creativity, right? Um, this is creativity where anybody sees it, they go, yeah, that's very, very creative. Even, you know, no one has to ask you what your standard is for creativity. Um, it's just pretty darn obvious. Um, and boy, we have lots of really big global problems that we have to solve, right? Solving those is going to be big C creativity. Um, at the same time, 
Uh, we all use little c, uh, little c creativity, everyday creativity, literally every single day. Everyone who's listening to me now um, has had to be creative at some point of this day already. The issue is that people tend not to think of this as creativity. So when you have people say, well, I'm not very creative. Yeah, but you remember yesterday when you locked yourself out of the house and still figured a way to get back in uh, to feed your hungry dog, right? Um, how did that happen? You use little c creativity. You're not gonna get a Nobel prize for that. It's not big c creativity, but it was creativity that helped you solve a problem that you had and you solved it effectively, little c creativity. Um, even something as simple as driving to work in, you're a little bit late. I know no one on this call would ever be late for work like me. And you're driving in and you just hit a traffic jam. Um, you immediately start thinking, all right, how can I go back roads? Are there other ways to go? Can I take a different highway, et cetera, right? That's little c creative problem solving. Um, this is what our children do. This is what our students do um, every single day, every single day, little c. Now, there's a third type that I think is really important. And I think as parents and also as educators, our goal is to help students turn their little c creativity into professional creativity or pro c creativity. This is creativity that goes beyond the everyday that helps them um, solve more sorts of professional problems. And even children face problems like this. If they're learning a musical instrument and they're struggling learning a uh, particular piece, um, they're gonna have to come up with new strategies to uh, master it. That's moving out of everyday creativity. That's not creativity that most people would face every day. Um, it's more of a professional level of creativity. Um, many gifted education models, when you really come down to it, are about helping students develop professional C, pro C creativity strategies as early as we can. Because we know that creativity is like any other muscle in your body. The more that you exercise it, the easier it is and the better you get at it, right? And so assuming most children are very creative, helping them move and do things that are more professional, pro C creativity, that is our goal. Huge caveat though, we're pretty sure a little C creativity becomes pro C creativity, becomes big C creativity. Uh, researchers don't have a great idea of how that actually happens. So like, you know, sitting down and I will occasionally hear people say, you know, our goal is to help these students win Nobel prizes one day. And I always sit back and go, I mean, yeah, that's an awesome goal. We have no idea how, how, how to do that. No one does. If they say they do, they're just guessing. Um, uh, we're pretty sure we know how to get from little C to pro C. Again, practice, practice, practice across lots of different areas. But we're not, we really don't know how to get that to turn into big C. My theory is that it's um, big C creativity is only obvious in retrospect. Um, and if we have time during uh, uh, Q&A at the end here, I, I can talk about that a little bit more. Um, but you know what? The vast majority of us are not gonna be big C creativity people. The vast majority of our children are not gonna be doing big C creativity. That's not our goal here. Um, our goal is to help them um, learn to appreciate their creativity, become confident with their creativity, and move it from that little, that um, uh, little C everyday creativity that they that they tend to do into pro C. So I'm going to give three fairly quick examples um, that are a little fun, uh, some more fun than others, and then uh, I'm going to wrap up sort of with uh, strategies that you can start using today, which I think is 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 um, is 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 always helpful. Um, so let's start with a. Uh, Productivity, because um, if you have a highly creative child, um, uh, they will run into lots of biases about their age. And um, I'll, I'll give some examples here. Um, so I, essentially what, what it comes down to is people who tend to show the most pro C creativity tend to be the most productive people among their peers. Um, uh, Simonton's 
um, chance configuration theory. He would not word it this way, but I think this is a fun way to uh, think about it. Um, it's like a lottery. Uh, you don't know which of your ideas is really going to take off. Uh, so you buy more lottery tickets. Buying more lottery tickets is producing more creative products. The more that you produce, the better the odds are that someone's going to say, ooh, that's a really good solution that you came up with, or, you know, that's an amazing piece of art. You know, that's an amazing, you know, solution, et cetera. Um, this also means that highly creative people in life tend to have the most good ideas. They also produce the most ideas that people don't think are very good. Um, uh, Steve Jobs is a great example. Um, since he's passed away, unfortunately, uh, all these legendary stories about Steve Jobs. Oh, he did this and he did this and he, and he did this. He had just as many massive failures as he did huge hits. Um, everyone thinks of Apple. Uh, most of his wealth when he died was actually Disney stock from Pixar. Pixar is probably his most creative accomplishment, right? But we don't even think of that with Steve Jobs in the end. Um, uh, there were lots of things, lots of great ideas he had that turned out to actually be not so great. He was the only one who really, really thought, thought that they were great. But boy, the great ideas he did have literally have changed the world. Again, uh, think about how things were different in 2006 before we got iPhones. Um, and actually it's funny, you can you can still Google and find reviews of the first iPhone. Some of the reviews are scathing. Like, what a stupid idea. No one wants to browse the web on their phone, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, uh, probably one of uh, humankind's greatest inventions, right? More ideas you have, more good ideas, but also ideas that, that aren't so good. Um, blah, 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 blah. Uh, this is just an old quote I found once about the history of science and essentially what the author is pointing out that um, everyone talks about Sir Isaac Newton as this brilliant scientist, um, but they forget that he was a physicist, he was an alchemist, and he was a theologian. None of his alchemy or theological ideas amounted to anything. Uh, in fact, there was lots of bad, bad ideas there. But we do remember him for those amazing successes. Why? He was very, very productive. Creative people tend to be very, very productive. Um, so this is a pretty standard creative productivity, um, creative productivity um, uh, curve. Uh, so no matter how you measure creativity, this is what it tends to look like. For most people in most disciplines, most crafts, pretty much any area of human endeavor, um, there's a big peak toward the early adulthood to early middle age. Then it shallows out a little bit, and then it tends to peak again at the end. Uh, this is especially true for women. Anybody have a guess about why that would be more true for women? Um, in fact, sometimes it actually would rotate. So the, the biggest productivity period comes late, 65 to 80, say. Anybody want to guess, or do, do you have a guess, since, since I can't hear you, um, about uh, why, why would that be for women, not men? Uh, people always, there's always one person who sort of says under their breath, um, uh, because he's dead. And that's actually not, not how I would put it, but that's pretty much what happens, right? Once we get some cheats. Kids, kids, kids do suck all your brain power. Um, uh, kids and husbands, I think I can speak for husbands everywhere. Uh, kids and husbands suck all of your brain power, right? And um, uh, in most cultures, I, um, women uh, bear by far uh, the biggest part of running the household, raising the children, running the family. Um, uh, so as your, as your husband retires, the kids have moved out, your husband may have passed away. Um, uh, uh, women seem to uh, um, tend to see a fairly big spike after that, after that happens. Um, over time, um, as 
Um, uh, as I'm not, I'm not in any way saying that we have gender equity in the workplace or at home. I'm not implying that at all. But as we've gotten better at that, uh, women's productivity curves are starting to look very much like men's. Now, it, it very much changes depending on the area that you're working in. Uh, I think I got the right side here. I've already talked about that. Um, uh, female chess players um, uh, tend to uh, be uh, very productive earlier. Um, movie producers, people on the entertainment side who aren't acting, uh, tend to follow the curve fairly, fairly closely. Um, novelists, fiction novelists, tend to have their peak actually later. It's much farther to the right. Um, uh, J.K. Rowling actually um, is an exception where um, her productivity roughly follows the standard curve. Um, uh, mathematicians, um, theoretical mathematicians peak before 30. Um, applied mathematicians tend to peak later. Um, and uh, I only use this guy because I have a funny, a funny story about him. I walked into, I think it was my last college math class as an undergrad. It was um, applied linear algebra, which I was dismayed to learn is not applied, is not linear, and is not algebra. Um, it's essentially matrices. And um, the professor had to be at least 80, and um, he... He was old school enough that he called raw that, that he called the roll when you got to class. And the first day he was going through, he got to my name and he hesitated. And I thought, oh, what's this about? And he goes, Plucker, Jonathan Plucker, you're not, you're not related to the world's most famous applied mathematician, Julius Plucker, are you? I, we think my family very distantly, maybe, but I did what any of you would have done in that in that situation. I said, yes, I am. And um, he was thrilled. He's like, oh my gosh, I'm gonna tell all of my colleagues. I can't believe, you know, Julius Plucker's nephew, I never said I was his nephew, um, is in my class. This is so amazing. Um, I did great in that class. And I am embarrassed to say I did not study once the entire semester after that point. So, but anyway. Applied mathematicians later. Um, poets tend to be earlier. Again, um, people who write long form fiction tend to be later. So the curve moves around a lot, but it does tend to hold this basic, basic shape for people. Uh, oh, I'm gonna give you one example. Um, I saw this on Twitter once. I went and checked every one of these ages. This is the age at which all of these famous people published their first fiction novel. And you read some of those and you go, there's no way that that's correct. That is exactly when they published their first novels, believe it or not. Uh, fiction novelists tend to be later in life. I, my working hypothesis is that um, it's just, you have more experience to write about, right? And as when we write fiction, we tend to write about our own experiences fairly lightly veiled. So it just gives you more grist for the mill, which I think is absolutely fascinating. Um, uh, Mark Twain wrote a lot, but it was nonfiction. He didn't start writing fiction till, until he was in his 40s. But some of these ages are, are surprising. Um, uh, it's never too late to write that novel. So if you've been sitting on that novel for 50 years, this is your time to start writing it. Okay, uh, young people face a lot of the same issues. There, there's this bias that older that that the older we get, we can't be creative. Research has shown that that is simply not true. Um, uh, and you know, again, if anything, people later in life can have a really big creative peak. It can be one of the best times for creativity in your life, maybe the best. Um, and uh, uh, but a very ambitious, talented young person who's highly creative, who is coming up with just amazing ideas, can be a real threat to people. And I have seen that as a teacher, as a parent. Um, uh, most people who encounter a you know, young, enthusiastic, highly, highly creative person um, uh, are very, very supportive. 
but sometimes they're not. And we have to be advocates for our children and for those students when people say silly things like, well, that looks creative, but I'm sure someone else in history has done that before. That is a true story. I heard one of my colleagues say that about a third grader, and I almost swallowed my tongue. I could not believe that her standard for creativity for these little kids was they have to think of something that no one in human history has done before. First of all, how would you even know, right? It's just, it's just crazy, crazy bias. Um, and it, you know, in the end, she wasn't a very creative teacher, and I think that's where it really came from. Um, most teachers are fantastic about this. Most uh, people in uh, professional settings are very good about encouraging young, creative people, uh, but some aren't, and we have to be very, very careful about that. They definitely need mentors, and they definitely need champions. Um, and in one reason why we think that um, creativity tends to peak younger um, is uh, from this quote from this great interview I found with this um, uh, famous British poet. Uh, you were so brave to strike out on your own when you were so, so young. She basically eloped from Pakistan with her husband and started publishing uh, poetry around the age of uh, 20, which again, poet. Poets tend to be more productive earlier. Um, and she just laughed and said, no, 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 we, we, we weren't brave. We, we essentially just didn't, just didn't know better. Um, young people tend to take more risks in part because they don't have sort of those handcuffs of um, experience on them. So they, they should be encouraged, but they do need to be mentored too to learn how to manage risk. Um, okay. Big takeaway, age can bring experience as long as it's tempered with a tolerance for ambiguity. It can only help to enhance creativity, but age and experience aren't a necessary condition for creativity. Um, we've got lots of good stories about this. Maybe we can come back to them, but uh, just for time reasons, I want, I want to move along. Um, again, I think the most important takeaway from a parent and educator perspective um, is that our kids, our students need creative champions. Um, so I, this is the model of creativity training that we use. Again, I'm not gonna get into the weeds because there's only one part I really wanna call your attention to. Um, and, and, and it is that, and so we started using this model about, boy, uh, just about 25 years ago now, which uh, makes me feel super, super old. Um, but um, we, we suspected that the reason why research about creativity techniques, like specific techniques, was so mixed. Sometimes they worked. Sometimes they seemed to make you less creative. Like it just didn't make sense. And the more that we talked about it and the more that we sort of studied people who showed lots of pro-C creativity, people who had lots of little C creativity, who seemed to, have a, who seemed to be using it to really increase their quality of uh, life um, is that they had really pro-creativity attitudes. They, they, they sort of weren't weighed down by all these uh, stereotypes about creativity. For um, example, that you have to be born creative and that only a few people are. We know that's not true, that you can't teach creativity. We know that that's not true, but our rough estimate is that each of those two big stereotypes are, are, are probably held by about 75% of people. So they're very pervasive. Um, there's also sort of this, you know, great person model of creativity. You know, people who do big C creativity um, are just like, you know, anointed from birth and uh, no matter what happened to them, they were gonna do that anyway. Um, I call that the, um, Hollywood myth, uh, and this is actually pretty funny. One of my former students now is a movie producer um, for a major studio. And he was talking to my students once and um, one of my students just kind of laid into him a little bit and said, you know, you guys keep making these biopics and yeah, they may win Oscars, but they're, but they're totally sending the wrong, um, the wrong message about what it takes to be creative. Like it's all, oh, 
you know, they just faced these hardships and maybe they were dealing with mental illness. And then, you know, they by themselves, you know, I uh, fulfilled their destiny and created this amazing thing. And she said that that's just not how creativity works. And we know it. And he, he, he was, um, he was extremely gracious and polite. He goes, those are all great points. I learned that in his classes too. He goes, how many of you are going to spend $12 on a movie ticket to go watch a movie about a team of people who were all well adjusted, weren't really dealing with any problems, who worked really hard to do pro C creativity. He's like, that's the most boring movie on the planet. And he goes, this is Hollywood. It's fake. Um, uh, I just thought that was all very, very funny, but it, um, and he's not wrong. I would not pay to see that. Right. But it, uh, at the same time, um, the media entertainment bombards us with these stereotypes about creativity that create these attitudes that we can't be creative, that we shouldn't be creative, that creativity is bad. Innovation is bad. Um, uh, but the reality is the exact opposite. So most of what we end up doing in helping people do, um, again, exercise those creative muscles is um, addressing their attitudes and beliefs. And we believe the best way to do that is to have them be creative, give them positive feedback. Um, if you don't like what your child has done, give them some pointers, but don't be excessively negative. There are enough critics in life. Life will take care of that for them. Um, just keep encouraging them to try again, to do something bigger, to do something a bit more complex. Um, um, again, fixing those attitudes, uh, I think, we, we, we think, um, is by far the most effective way um, to increase creativity over the long haul. Uh, but, 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 that's what I just said. I know am I doing on time here? Perfect. Okay. Um, Definitions. Uh, I hear people talk about definitions of creativity all the time. I, most of it is just kind of wasted. This is the definition that we and many of our colleagues use. The, the, the only, it, it's a little bit complex. The, the most important part is novelty and useful, um, novelty and usefulness as defined within a social context. Novelty, uniqueness, originality, whatever you want to call it, um, usefulness, task appropriateness, um, uh, but, but all within a social context. And I'm gonna give you a couple very quick examples of this. Um, uh, in, in, and in part, it's because we need to acknowledge, especially when we're thinking about little c creativity, um, a little bit less with pro c creativity, but even then, uh, but especially with little c creativity, um, uh, that context is really important. So my fourth grade, um, so my third grade teacher colleague who said, you know, like her standard was that um, it, it, it was novelty and usefulness if no one in the world had ever done it before. I mean, I, just, I mean, these were nine and 10 year olds, right? The standard should be, is it novel and useful for a nine or 10 year old? And I would argue at that age, um, the social context is that child and their development and their learning, learning and healthy development. So the standard is, is it novel and useful for that child in that moment with the thing that they're working on? If it is, it's creative. I don't care if the student next to them is doing it. If it's different and useful for your child, it's creative, no matter what anyone else has done. Because your child's creativity doesn't care what everyone else has done. They're trying to do the, that, that creative task, solve that problem that's right in front of them. That's what matters. We tend to really create these broad sweeping definitions that essentially creatively disenfranchise most of us. And that's not fair. And that's also not how creativity works, right? So um, defining the social context is really, really important. And again, I think when we're talking to children, especially younger children, the social context is their own personal development. Whether it's unique or useful for anybody else does not matter that much. Very quick example. Um, this is the, on the left, uh, the now 17 year old and on the right, the now 21 year old. Um, 
I haven't used these pictures in, <laughs> since before the pandemic. It actually makes my heart hurt a little bit. Um, um, uh, I love them dearly. Um, and we would, uh, we used to live in uh, the Midwest, close to a big artist colony. And uh, twice a year, you would bring up canvases and people of every single age uh, could paint all day long at this beautiful, this beautiful, I, it's essentially a historic um, farm that was really an artist colony, especially um, 50, 60 years ago that they have maintained. And um, it, uh, they would paint. Uh, my son was obviously very, very young. He'd paint for five minutes and go, all right, this is great. I'm done. And and he'd go try to catch frogs and you know, they had to have these ponds there. Uh, my daughter would uh, sit there. I Actually, she'd be embarrassed if I pointed this out, but um, she is actually uh, talking to one of her imaginary friends there. And she, uh, she would paint all day long. Um, and uh, it, was, um, uh, it was just fun. It was just fun to see. At the end of the day, whatever you've painted gets displayed. And then the judges would go by um, and they would evaluate everyone's paintings. Um, it, would, it wouldn't make any sense to evaluate not only their art against that of professional artists, amateur artists who have been doing it for decades, um, um, adults who have just picked it up. Like they're, they're all going to look more creative if, if we have the context to be everybody. Um, but that's not what that's not what they do, right? They have different categories. They have different categories. And so, um, uh, in fact, they had an under six category that he would be in, and then they'd have a seven to twelve category that she would be in, right? Um, respecting the context in which their creativity was being produced. That makes perfect sense, right? In schools, we tend to not do that. We just lump everyone together. Um, which I don't think makes sense. How am I doing on time? Okay, uh, I'm going to tell a very quick story here. Um, some of you may have heard me tell this story before. Uh, that is my late grandfather. Unfortunately, he's passed away recently. Um, he was a lifelong gardener, and I was visiting uh, my grandparents once, and um, he was a very, uh, he was very, very funny, but it was a very dry, under his breath humor. So he was not effusive at all. And he comes running out of the house as I pull up and he goes, oh, gosh, I have to show you something. This is amazing. So this is a plant growing in his front yard. Um, and uh, he's like, look at how big this thing is. It's amazing. And I was like, yeah, that's a really big plant. It looks really familiar to me, but I could not place it. And so we talked for a few minutes and I was like, Grandpa, I'm sorry. What kind of plant is that? And he, he kind of looked at me with a little bit of disgust and he was just like, it's a weed, obviously. And I said, oh, it was really awkward pause for five or six minutes. And then I was like, why did you grow a weed in the front yard? And um, he was blessed with many gifts. Height was not one of them. But even then, that's still about a, a seven foot tall weed. And he said, you know, um, I've been pulling this weed for 75 years, ever since I grew up on our family farm. Um, I'm so tired of pulling them. I just decided to try to grow the world's biggest weed. So I've been, you can kind of see that he had uh, staked it out. He fertilized it, he watered it every single day. And I'm pretty sure he succeeded in growing the world's biggest weed. Now, what you can't see because that's polaroid glass is that my grandmother is just to the right on the inside. I can just see the outline of her there. Um, she sat there the entire time with her arms folded. I could not hear her, but she never stopped talking. And I am sure she thought this was insane. Um, this is the sort of thing that would drive her to distraction. Maybe his ulterior motive, I don't know. I can't uh, speak for him now. But um, uh, so here's my question. Was this creative? Was it creative for my grandfather? Was it different and useful to him? Yes, it was. He wanted to challenge himself and he did it. It's definitely creative for him. Was it creative for my grandmother? It was, it was unique, but it was not useful. It was a huge waste of time and money, right? Um, uh, what, what, what about for me though, right? Was it, putting aside that I'm using it for the story, so I guess that makes it useful. 
Uh, was it different? I've never seen a weed that tall before or since. Was it useful? And I would argue it was because my grandfather was someone who was always so proud of everybody else in the family, but he never called attention to himself, um, even though he was a great, great guy. Um, he just deflected it constantly. This is the one time I saw him actually try something creative and to be really proud of how hard he had worked and how successful he was. So yeah, it still is a great memory. Um, I was there at the hospital uh, when he died. If nothing else, keeping this story alive helps me not think about that when I think about my grandfather. I think about that time he grew that damn seven foot tall weed, right? So it's very, very useful to me. Three of us, for two of us, it's creative for very different reasons. For the third person, not creative at all. And you know what? That's okay. That's okay. All right, we've got about five minutes left here. Uh, I'm going to ignore that. Um, creativity can and should be defined. Um, some people will say that creativity can't be defined. And those are usually, that's usually smoke and mirrors. Um, I'll hear artists say that sometimes. I I've have many artist friends who, who believe it absolutely can be defined. I, I tend to hear it from poets sometimes. Um, I hear it from economists a lot, which is really interesting. And again, some uh, visual and uh, performing artists, they say, oh, you can't define creativity. Well, guess what? Creativity only exists because we defined it. So of course you can define creativity. However, I don't think the definition matters that much. I think whatever definition what, whatever sort of standards work for you and your family, and just use that. Who cares what anybody else thinks? Creativity at its core is a personal human development thing. Um, okay, so I had someone um, a few years ago ask me, okay, this is all great, but if you could make only two recommendations for stuff that I can immediately start doing that will help my children and students do um, like more and better creativity. I'm gonna give you a three, because I can't just pick two, and I'm gonna do them these, these very, very quickly. Um, uh, modeling, um, uh, parents and teachers are students' most important role models. They're watching us even when we think they're not watching us. The most creative elementary school that I ever saw was one in which um, uh, the principal uh, started having teachers tell students what their creative goals were for themselves every Monday. Like this week, I'm gonna to try to do this creatively. Sometimes it was about teaching, sometimes it was about family, sometimes it was about their own personal, uh, uh, writing these short stories and essays, whatever. Um, uh, and it was, uh, it was amazing to see how students were so excited to share their, share their creativity with teachers, parents, adults. Um, uh, uh, they're watching us we have a responsibility to be as creative as we can to show them that creativity is a good thing and it's a lifelong skill. So something as simple as indulging your own creativity and making sure that your children see you doing it and that it's a, it's a good thing and don't make excuses for it. If you wanna dust off your camera and get back into photography, do it, absolutely do it. It sends a very strong message to our kids. Um, articulation, I don't have time to get into articulation in um, uh, great depth. Um, it, uh, I, I would normally use the uh, Van Gogh example. Uh, if we have time, I will come back to it, but, um, uh, or the Emily Dickensy um, example. Uh, articulation, um, the one common char characteristics that all pro C and big C creativity people have, the one common characteristic is that they were very good at convincing people that they were creative, or they had other people around them who were really good at convincing people that they were creative. They were really good at marketing and selling the solutions that they were coming up to for problems. Um, from uh, Gandhi to Isadora Duncan to Steve Jobs, et cetera. Um, uh, really good at going out there and convincing people, sometimes taking years, if not decades to do it, um, uh, that their work was creative. We don't give kids much practice that, practice with that. 
um, we, um, we uh, tend to have them create something and then we say, you know, um, uh, you, know you, should, you should let your work speak for itself. Creative people almost never let their work speak for itself. They go out there and they show you why their solutions, why their creative products are creative. So if your child does something, especially if you don't get it, have them explain it to you. That is a skill, again, that they need to develop. It's a muscle that they have to exercise to get better at it. Um, uh, the more that they have to talk about their work and why it's appropriate, why it's original, the better children get at this. Um, it's not uncommon for me to get graduate students who have never had to do that for their work. Um, and yet they're trying to do creative work and share it with the world. And they've had no practice for 20 or 30 years or more. So you cannot start early enough saying, wow, that's a really interesting finger painting. Tell me about it. Okay, that's great. Why did you do this? Why did you use this color? This is, you know, cool, great, thanks. It doesn't have to be critical. Just make sure that you're interacting with them and getting them to talk about their creativity. And then uh, finally, and I will wrap up here, um, experiences I think is really, really important. Um, I spend a lot of time uh, uh, working with school districts, working with um, policymakers on things like educational equity. And there is no question that in our uh, society, we have haves and we have have nots. The biggest difference between those groups is really social capital. Um, and uh, what it means in the creativity context is that students who are growing up upper middle class or upper class um, uh, just every day get exposed to lots of new experiences um, uh, that many of the rest of us growing up, and this was certainly my case, um, we just didn't have the know-how, we didn't have the resources to go to museums, to go to do lots of things. Um, uh, just exposing your child to as many things as you can and then talking about it is really, really important. Maybe it's art, um, maybe it's different sports, maybe it's Maybe it's anything, maybe talking about different jobs or you read something in uh, the newspaper that's interesting um, and saying, hey, have you, have you guys ever thought about this? This is a really interesting article just to try to help them build up that knowledge base about what the possibilities are. Um, I think it's less about building up knowledge than knowledge about possibilities. Um, uh, you know, to like see someone who has a really unique job. I have um, a very close friend whose son um, went to a great law school and is now one of the best agents for street artists in the entire world. There probably aren't a lot of people in that job, right? But it's so cool to have him come and talk to people and say, okay, here's why I went in this really interesting direction in life. Um, uh, every time students see that, they're seeing new opportunities, new directions that they can go. We think that's a huge part of this creativity puzzle. So modeling, articulation, experiences, um, the more the better in all three cases. And with that, I believe that is it. I'm a couple minutes over. I apologize, Sarah and Heather, um, but I am happy to take uh, questions here and um, again, I will make sure that you get access to this PowerPoint so you don't need to contact me about it. Um, and I will stop sharing. Questions, comments, questions I can answer for you. Thank you, Jonathan. That was wonderful. We are we have the Q&A down in the uh, toolbar below for anybody who would like to ask questions and we will feed them to you. It can take a minute to type, so we'll we'll give it a, a couple of minutes. Yeah, you can just type it type it into the chat if you're having uh, a problem with uh, the Q and A. That is another great option.
you don't ask a question, I'm going to tell that Van Gogh story. So you've been forewarned. Go ahead. Jonathan, we do have a question. What is the best thing to do when your child comes across people who think narrowly about creativity? Uh, I tend to think of that's a great question. Um, a creative child will absolutely run into this all the time. Um, and I have asked lots of people this same question, like, what do they do? Uh, the principal at that school um, that I mentioned, I specifically asked her this. I said, okay, great. You're doing an amazing job with these kids. And then in sixth grade, they go to middle school where you've already told me none of this stuff happens. What do you do? Um, and uh, she said that she thinks about it um, as an inoculation, that if we build up the right attitudes and we help children understand that they're gonna face lots of naysayers, but that, that's just part of life, um, and you should listen to naysayers in case they give you sort of feedback that you can use to make your ideas better, but you should never let anyone be a stop sign to you creatively, um, and that you should just keep pushing forward. And so um, with my own kids, um, uh, uh, my daughter in college wrote what I thought was an amazing amazing paper, like uh, one of those things where you read it, you go, I did something right in life to, to, to you know, deserve this kid. It was, it was so interesting. Um, uh, and her professor was like, yeah, I, you know, I guess it's good. Yeah, it's fine. And so she got a good grade. But then I said like, no, this, this is a publishable paper. Like th this is an amazing piece of scholarship. But her professors were like, yeah, but you're 20. And I thought, okay, who cares, right? Like you should keep pushing on that. Who cares what your, what your professors say? Again, um, sometimes our children need us to be their uh, champions. So, uh, ba -ba -ba -ba. so we have question we, here. Yeah, we uh, have one more question for you. You talked about modeling creativity for young people. How do I avoid getting 20 some copies of my product if I give a model for a project where I want to encourage creativity? Yeah, um, I run into this, believe it or not, in um, graduate school even. Um, I do not provide examples or models um, because if I, if I do that, 75% of what I get back will be a variation on whatever I said or, or, or whatever I shared, showed to them, et cetera. Um, if you have lots of different models that you can share, um, so that there's like five completely different approaches to the project or what have you, I, but you're, 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 you're still pretty much going to get five you're still going to get variations on those five, um, which I, um, what I do instead is I tell students, I'm not going to give them examples, but I'm going to give them a lot of feedback in that um, they can redo it as many times as they need to until we're both happy with it. Um, and uh, that I think is more useful than actually giving models. Um, uh, because th there's just, I, people love to be different in the same ways, right? That's sort of psychology in a nutshell, if you will. Um, so everyone wants to be different, but they're still conforming at the same time because they're nervous. Um, they don't want to go too far out on that creative limb. Um, the way that I do it is I don't give models. Um, what I get back is all over the map. And then I give feedback to each person based on what I think that they're individually capable of. So if I've got 20, 20 students, you know, people generally on most assignments do roughly the same thing, but I get a lot more outliers than uh, many of my colleagues do. I, I think that's the best way to handle that actually. Uh, was there a rubric question? Rubrics can help, you know, uh, you know, uh, Patricia, I, um, uh, I'm not a fan of rubrics for the exact reason that we just talked about. Um, uh, I think they become recipes. And so um, I've been playing with what people are calling single point rubrics, which are a little bit vaguer. 
Um, uh, but, but, but because I let students revise again and again and again, it takes them a while to actually believe me, but I, but I get most of them there eventually. Um, I don't find rubrics to be very helpful, um, uh, which my bosses find enraging because they've all been taught that we have to have a rubric for everything. And then this guy comes along and says nothing. Uh, I've got, can I answer one more quick one here? Um, what's one thing you do routinely to promote your own creativity? Um, I try to do new things whenever I can. Um, uh, if we're traveling and someone in uh, the family says, hey, we should do X today. You know, 20 years ago, I would have absolutely said, I do not want to do that. Go and do it. I'm going to do something else. Um, over time, I've really pushed myself um, uh, to sort of take that regulator off and just say, okay, let's try it. You know what? 75% of the time, I don't really enjoy it. 25% of the time, I feel like the world has opened to me. It can be the smallest thing sometimes. Um, uh, I'm more of a photography person than um, a uh, visual art person. I guess photography is visual art, but like painting and things like that. So this past summer, I decided I was going to invest money in learning how to um, paint. And so I painted all summer long. And the results have gone from atrocious to just not very good, but I'm enjoying it. It's making me see the world in different ways. Um, I'm obsessed with clouds now. I'm trying to paint the perfect cloud. Um, you know what? Really hard. And every person I go to tells me to do it a completely different way. It's this immense problem that I'm trying to solve. Um, uh, when I flew here, I was looking at the clouds, trying, okay, how would I paint the shadow on that cloud? It, um, uh, so i uh, constantly challenging myself um, in different and new sorts of ways. Um, uh, learning the guitar is probably the next impossible challenge that I will um, pick up. So uh, I believe I am out of time. Thank you, everybody, for everything. Um, uh, I will get these slides back out to everyone. And uh, the last slide has all my contact information. If you have any uh, follow-up questions, please do not hesitate to um, email me, send me a DM on Twitter, Instagram, whatever.